Good evening, everybody. This is Ezra St. White. Today I'm going to be reading from the book Born Guilty by Jason Cohn. I'm going to start on page 22, and I'll just read about seven or eight pages. I hope everybody is doing well. I hope everybody is thinking for themselves, because that's what it's all about. The Promethean spirit is alive, and we must make sure that we do not squander our destiny, because we all know that others out there are waiting for us to fail. So if you don't do this for your family or your children, do it for your future. Do it because you know others are waiting for you to fail, and do it to prove them wrong. So let's go free, let's live our own life, and let's begin reshaping our destiny. It begins here, it begins now. It begins by building our word and our narrative. And thanks to Jason Cohn, we have a ground to stand on with our new narrative. Promethean hails, let's begin. Page 22, from the book Born Guilty, by Jason Cohn. Now that I have a coffee, we can get down to business. I grew up not too far from here in northern Virginia, just outside the district. Growing up beside D.C. Langley, Fort Meade, Quantico, Crystal City, and then working on the hill, provided me a unique insight into the world of power and politics, the majority of people can't even fathom the machinery behind the scenes. Most people are unaware that every country is dominated by an official narrative composed of interpretations, obfuscations, and inventions. These narratives define each country's purpose, its heroes and villains, its history and its identity, the country's storyline, so to speak. Naturally, reader, I hope you don't mind me calling you reader. I have little choice. Naturally, it's important to know the difference between the country's official narrative and a person's opinion. There are many signs, but the easiest way to tell is the difference in power. If you contradict the narrative, there are repercussions, and these repercussions, needless to say, are further proof that there is an official narrative the masses believe the official narrative to varying degrees, but the masses adopting the regime's superstitions don't establish the origin of the superstitions in the masses. That's misattribution. Since power dictates, we can logically conclude that the perceived interests of the most powerful people and collectives drive the official narrative. Not truth, not fact, not some red herring, not what's good for the people, not what's good for our country's founding stock. Nothing but what serves the power holders, their mythologies, their agendas, hatreds, insecurities, and profit. Unfortunately, this phenomenon is too far complex for most people to understand. Their socio-political immaturity and the anti-white ideas within which they are infected prevent them from perceiving how the system works. In many cases, they're even unable to see that there is a system. Let me ask you, reader, what if the power holders' interests are contradictory to our interests? What if all peoples are not interchangeable? What if all cultures are not equal? What if diversity isn't strength? I know you've spent your entire life immersed in the regime's force-fed narrative, but you've come, me, you've come to me to go free, which means you suspect that something is wrong with the world. You've noticed the contradictory precepts in the narrative, the blatant hypocrisy, the authoritarian controls, and the contradiction between the narrative's explanation of the world and your personal experience. The cognitive dissonance rattles you. It's hard to handle 
and it's hard to believe the regime has been lying to you. Aren't all the endless corporate and governmental scandals evidence enough that the most powerful and wealthiest people are not above wrongdoing when it's to their benefit? What if the regime is lying to you because it profits when you believe the lies? And what if continuing to believe the lies destroys your future, your family, your community, our heritage, and our country? Does it surprise you that many experts have researched and documented the inconsistencies between the regime's narrative and the hard data? The authorities have noted uniformly in the narrative despite abundant empirical contradiction. Their findings incriminate the regime. So why haven't these experts been on the news? Isn't it because it's not in the regime's interest to tell you about the inconsistencies in the narrative? And what about retaliation? How many times have you witnessed dissenters attacked, their reputations assassinated for contradicting the regime? How many times have you watched the colossal regime apply pressure on dissenters until they publicly humiliate themselves, making apology after groveling apology? It happens all the time. No, you're not in going to see the reporters from the establishment media interviewing the experts. But suppose the experts are right. Wouldn't it mean that you've been intentionally lied to your whole life? Wouldn't it mean that the lies were intended to disarm you, to make you psychologically weak, so you'd be easy to exploit? So easy, in fact, that you wouldn't think to deserve it, that you would think to, to deserve it, that our people deserve it. And if that's the case, wouldn't it mean the regime is our enemy? Wouldn't it also mean that if the regime, the regime's interest to keep you blind to this fact, to mislead you with even more lies so that you're overcome with disbelief, fear, and even anger for those who contradict the regime's narrative? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? If you're like most, you're feeling some measure of disgust disquiet right now. Don't you wonder where the discomfort comes from? Should examining facts and pursuing truth unsettle you? Is that normal? And if it is not normal, why did the regime plant it in you? Now you've come to me to go free, which requires that we explore subjects the regime, its academia, and its establishment media have pathologized, marginalized, and declared off limits to you. Either you're willing to look where the regime doesn't want you to look, hear what it doesn't want you to hear, know what it doesn't want you to know, or you walk back through that door without the knowledge of how to save yourself and those you love. I'm going to close my eyes when I reach the end of this sentence. If you choose to leave, you'll be gone by the time I open them. If you stay, We'll move forward. Ah, I was right about you. I see potential that others have overlooked. I see talent too. One moment, that's my cell. Hello? Yes? Reader is here. Hold on. I'm going to step into the other room to take this call about the coming event. You've come on a busy weekend. Things are about to change. You were almost too late. But don't worry about that now. You'll begin going free in earnest. In My Nation, My Fight, you'll find an essay titled Crucible. It's a true story concerning my years in junior high school, 7th and 8th grade, and the summer in between. A pivotal time in my life and inspiring to all who read it. My Nation, My Fight, Crucible. I learned many things from my teachers and the media, but his was the name I heard more often than any other. In the twilight classrooms of elementary school, the mechanical hum of rickety projectors lulled into the hypnosis, whirling and hissing and billowing acrylic, ac acrid clouds 
as the hymn and incense of liturgy splashing his image across countless scenes. 30-inch televisions fed by VHS tape and infused with his countenance bathed our upturned faces in flickering light, entranced us with the celluloid deity and his zealous followers singing his praise. Part man, part God, part saint, part savior. What more? I wasn't exactly sure, but I knew he, wor- he was worshipped, that he was only spoken of in a quoted reverential tone, and that only in such tones were we permitted to speak of him. Elementary school now behind me, a new era of my life had begun. Day one in junior high school, and there I stood beneath a billboard, a shrine, a larger-than-life picture of this man, hanging ten feet above the floor. His was the only image in the communal area known as the commons, where row upon row of lockers grew out of the carpeted floor, creating pews for the children who gathered there, the unwary disciples of the state's new anti-white religion, learning and worshiping under the fathomless stare of the state's new god, Martin Luther King Jr. From the heights the state's idol gazed upon the faithful as a tangible and benevolent deity, calling them to duty in the service of equality by the way of inequality, quotas, exemptions, set-asides, subsidies, and he glared upon the faithless as a zealous god, his tolerance, activist shaming, ostracizing, threatening and bludgeoning dissenters into conversion. More to the point, the idol seemed to consider us as a hawk considers its prey from the clouds, as I would painfully learn, much like the fearsome talons and razor-sharp beak wielded by the airborne predator, the idol bristled with an assortment of weapons with which to compel conversion and subservience. Nailed to the floor, Before the idol, I pondered the only name I had heard nearly as often as Martin Luther King. If this MLK represented all that was worthy of worship and adoration, the other represented his antithesis, the personification of unadulterated evil. The former was said to be the superior superior and savior, deliverer of unmatched wisdom, divinity, inspired leader, intellectual visionary, persecuted martyr, and victim of white racism. The latter was said to be murderer, slayer of millions of innocents, acuter of madness, an advocate of a demonic vision. In contrast to the black saintly MLK, the demon's race was white, and his vision, in part, was informed by his concern for the well-being of the white race. If MLK is Lord and Savior, then Adolf Hitler, we were taught, was the devil. It dawned on me that Christ and Lucifer had been replaced by MLK and Hitler. The doctrines, too, had changed. Where once we had Jesus Christ and the teachings of Christianity we now had MLK and the teachings of anti-whiteism, misleadingly named liberalism and progressivism, by its deceitful advocates. And similarly, where we once had Lucifer's desperate effort to corrupt mankind and conquer the Christian kingdom of heaven, we now had Hitler and the, and the desire to preserve the white race and Western civilization. All right, everybody, I'm going to stop there. We're on page 33. Now, this book is called Born Guilty by Jason Cohn. I would encourage everybody to buy this book and buy his two new books, 
Prometheus Rising, Take Back Our Destiny, and the standalone version of Crucible. Remember, this is about learning. It's about taking back our destiny and our self, taking back our self-destiny so that one day we can be great leaders. One day we can express how to take back our destiny. If we don't have the narrative to express how to take back our destiny, then we will never be able to put it into word, and that word will never manifest into form. As of now, our history and our destiny has been stripped from us. As men and women of Western kind, we should be very concerned for our children growing up in an anti-white narrative. It's harmful for their psychology. It's harmful for their being to grow up and feel like their history, their past, and their people are evil. So, the last thing I'm going to say is that we as individuals need to grow. And once we grow as individuals, once we strengthen ourselves, we can have our own idea of what our destiny is. And that idea people will grab onto. It's not about the organization's idea. It's not about the collective's idea right now. Maybe it will be one day, but without a strong leader, a collective does not have the, the mind that one person has and that one person can tune into. So it's up to one person to create the destiny for that one person. And if the collective wants to gather around that, then they can. But a collective does not have a mind like a person does. So we as individuals need to think about what we can do every day to gain more freedom in this world. We need to think about how we can take back our destiny, as Jason Cohn says. We need to start living as the Prometheans. And if everybody would like to get a little more information on Prometheanism, you can look at the interview by Jason Giorgiani, who has a book called Prometheism, a new book out as well. And there's a lot of insight into that about what it means to be a Promethean and what is the history behind Promethean. So, I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Until next time, be good to your family, be good to your children, and keep the Promethean spirit alive.